And why does Christianity survive 2,004 years after his death? Was he a prophet, the son of God? How does he become this? Yeah, sure, it means that to you. An epic saga from the dawn of history. What or who was Jesus as far as you're concerned? I think it's, the, it's a defining question for a Christian. Who was Jesus? That question's been widely debated over centuries, has it not? And fortunately, we don't have to take our cues and our answers from talk shows and talk show hosts, amen? Because we can actually turn to eyewitness accounts, eyewitness accounts of, of those who spent time with Jesus, those who learned from Jesus, those who walked with Jesus, those who saw Jesus die on the cross, and those who experienced the power of his resurrection, amen? Amen. And that is found in the Gospels. And so we think of the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's really what we're going to do as we, we move into this series called Meeting Jesus. And for, every, for those of you that have been coming over the last few weeks, you know that we actually met Jesus through the Gospel of John. We remember Jesus as the miracle worker and the Lord of all. And now we're going to move into this series, and we're going to look at the three remaining Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or what we call the synoptic Gospels. Now, that's kind of a, a fancy word. It's actually a Greek word. It's made up of two Greek words, and the first of those words is syn, S-Y-N, and not like S-I-N, but it's syn, and it means together, right? So synthesis, synonym, so syn, and then optic, which means to view. And so we think of the synoptic gospels, we think of the gospels that are viewed similarly. And these three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they recount Jesus' story approximately, they fall on the same journey, but of course each one from a unique perspective. And so when we think about that, we think in the three go synoptic gospels along with the gospel of John, we see that the gospels display four different portraits of the same Jesus. Now, you might say, how is it possible? How can four different pictures, how can four different portraits show the same person? Let me introduce to you someone that's very near and dear to my heart. His name is Silas, and he's our youngest grandson, Amy and I, our youngest grandson. We have six, and he's the youngest. And since He's not old enough to not, he doesn't care if he's used as a sermon illustration. I figured it'd be okay to use him, right? Amen. So here's Silas. And so this is a picture of Silas when grandpa asked to take his picture. Look at that smile. Yeah. How, this is the same picture though when grandma asked him to do the same. Oh, hey, hey. I'm not throwing grandma under the bus here, but this is a picture of when grandma tells him a joke. And this is Silas when grandpa tells him one of his granddad jokes, right? They're grander than those old dad jokes, right? Well, we laugh and you go, okay, well, which one is Silas? Which one is he? They all are. That's right. They all are. And so similarly in the Gospels, it gives us four unique pictures of the same Jesus and so while each gospel, it follows Jesus on a similar journey, each one actually recounts it a little bit different. And each one provides us a beautiful experience that lets us see Jesus from a different perspective and gives us a little more insights, and it's also extremely valuable for us. And so today, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark. And you might say, well, gosh, I thought, I thought Matthew came first. That's what Dennis said. We're, we're changing things up on you. I'm going to cover the Gospel of Mark today. Pastor Kevin will take Matthew and Luke in the weeks to come. So the Gospel of Mark, who was it written by? Well, it was written by a guy named John Mark around 63 A.D., and John Mark, if you might remember, he actually is in the book of Acts, and he went on a missionary journey. He was a close associate of the Apostle Paul, and he had an uncle named Barnabas. Well, John Mark also was a very close associate of the Apostle Peter. And Apostle Peter, of course, was one of Jesus' closest disciples. 
And so what we see in the Gospel of Mark then is we actually see this is Peter's eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, and John is recording that in Mark's Gospel, John Mark. And so what we ask is, okay, so why was it written? Well, it was written to actually preserve the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus, and it was written to this young church that was starting up in Rome. And of course, this young church in Rome, the believers there were facing a lot of different challenges. And one of those challenges was people were really challenging them on who was Jesus? And did he really say, was he really the son of God? So this young church was really being challenged on that, on Jesus and who he was. Well, they were also being challenged on how to live. How do they raise their families in a culture that's so filled with immorality? Pretty much anything goes, right? And that was what was going on in Rome at the time. And they also knew that in, there was this impending persecution that was going to come their way. In fact, in 64 AD, the emperor Nero claimed all-out assault on Christians. So this gospel was written shortly before that came. And it sounds a little bit like today, does it not? Not that Nero is coming, but, but as Christians today, we face a lot of challenges to our faith, do we not? And so the Gospel of Mark, not only was it written for those believers 2,000 years ago, but it also was written for us. And so what's the big picture then that Mark's Gospel paints for us? And that is that Jesus is the suffering servant, son of God. And so what I wanna do in our time today is I wanna focus first on that second part that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, the Gospel of Mark makes this point throughout. It's consistent. Jesus is the Son of God. And it does this through multiple sources, but I want to really narrow in on four examples, four different sources. And the first snapshot that we see is that God the Father proclaimed it and God the Spirit affirmed it. And so if you have your bulletins, this is where you get to fill in those blanks. And I want you to turn with me, if you will, and Mark Chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. It's this beautiful picture, is it not, of the Trinity in action. We see God the Father speaks. And you know, this is actually the first time that God has spoken in over 400 years. The last time recorded in scripture is in the Old Testament book of Malachi. And so now we have the Father, God the Father speaking. Significant moment in history for God the Father to speak. We also see God the Spirit anointing Jesus and the presence and the power of God. And so what we see here on display, this is a public coronation of Jesus, the new king. Jesus, the son of God, has come to save his people. Just a beautiful picture of that. And so we also say then, well, what about from other sources? Do we have any other sources that declare that Jesus is the son of God? The second snapshot we see is that demons and impure spirits acknowledged it. In Mark 3.11, we read these words, whenever the impure spirits saw him, and that's Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. When you think of that, these are the evil spiritual forces that would have the most to lose, and they wanted more than anything to not allow Jesus to do his mission, to fulfill the mission to save the world. And yet here they were, bowing down before Jesus, declaring his sovereignty, Amen. And we think about that and we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus wasn't the son of God, why would they do that? So we learn, here's another source. Well, how about from human sources? Do we have any humans, right? We look at another snapshot and we see that a leader who supervised and witnessed his death exclaimed it. So I wanna take you to the foot of the cross and really seconds, moments before Jesus' death. And we read these words in Mark 15, verses 37 to 39. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Now, this is a Roman centurion. 
and think about what he's. He is highly qualified, he is expert, and he has to have extreme loyalty to Caesar and those ruling in Rome. And for him to make this declaration that someone other than Caesar was God would have meant for him that was high treason. And he could have been executed for saying that. But yet, he did. He did. So what about Jesus? I mean, what did Jesus claim? It's kind of interesting because I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, probably more than I care to share, but I spent a lot of time over there. And one of the things that I always got asked was, you know, those people who said that Jesus, they don't really believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they would say, well, Jesus never said he was divine. Well, when we read the Gospel of Mark, we read otherwise. We read that Jesus himself, he confirmed it. We take you to a snapshot where Jesus has been falsely accused and Jesus is now appearing before the religious leaders, before the high court, the Sanhedrin. And we read these words in Mark 14, verses 60 to 62. It says, then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not gonna answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. You see, throughout the Old Testament, we see this promise of a son of man and a son of God who would come to save his people. And so what we see here is that Jesus is emphatically stating that he is that son of man and son of God. He is the Messiah. And so Jesus admits he is God. His own admission right here. And so after this statement, what do we learn? We read later that the high priest then, he says that he tore his robe, right? And then he declared, blasphemy. Jesus is speaking blasphemy. And of course, Jesus would go to the cross. Jesus' statement here effectively became his own death sentence. And so Mark's gospel, then, we see clearly from multiple sources that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, why would Mark want to make sure that that point was so clear? Why would he want us to understand that? Well, see, for us, that's the foundation of our faith, amen? Is that Jesus is the Son of God. We know we read, it says, if we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means Jesus is God, the Son of God, then what? It says, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved, amen? So we have to understand that. And yet, sadly, there's many Christians who still struggle with that, who still don't fully understand and embrace that. And so Mark is speaking to us today to remind us of that. And it also gives us a great example because if somebody were to walk in and ask you tomorrow, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus claimed to be divine? You could say, let me show you in the Gospel of Mark, right? It's right here. And so this gives us a very practical teaching and a reminder of who Jesus is. And we also see in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is also the suffering servant. And as part of that, the messianic prophecies that we saw in the Old Testament, we knew that there would be this Messiah would also come as a servant who suffers for his people. And so we read just one example in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And of course, Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus came. And I want you to hear these words from Isaiah 53, 11. It says, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. You see, Isaiah speaking is saying that there is a Messiah and he is gonna come and he will suffer but in so doing, he will bear the sin of mankind. And for those that know him, he will make them right with God. And this Messiah will suffer beyond imagine. But he will come. He will be brought to life. And he will get to experience and see the joy, the fruit of what he has done. Who does that sound like? Jesus, amen? 
And we also see that Jesus himself, he affirmed, he affirmed that he was this suffering servant. And Jesus says in Mark 8, 31, we read this. It says, he then began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And Jesus prophesying the prophecy that Isaiah prophesied about him. And we know that that all came true. We also read in Mark 10, 45, it says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, here's Jesus, the king of glory, who left, who set aside his glory in heaven and he came to mankind, to earth, in the form of a servant to give his life as a ransom for many. So I want you just to think about that for a moment, that Jesus came to serve you. He came to serve you. He came to serve you. And he came to serve me by offering his life for our sins so that we could be made right and that we could spend eternity with him, amen, in his glory. And so Mark's message then for us, it beautifully captures that in a world that claims many things about Jesus, we can know and trust in his authenticity, divinity, and his sovereignty. He's authentic. I mean, Jesus is real. He is who he said he was. He did what he said he would do. And he is alive today and still doing what he promised to do. Amen? And Jesus is also divine. I mean, he is the creator and sustainer of all life. He is the only one that can offer eternal life. And so he also promises us that in him, we can live life to the full. We can have life abundantly. And Jesus is also sovereign. He is the king of kings. He's the prince of peace. He's the Lord of lords. There's nothing in all of creation that he is not ruler and Lord over. That means our situations, our life, he is sovereign in all things. And he will fulfill the promises that he's made for each of us and for us when we place our faith in him, Jesus, the suffering servant, son of God. And the gospel of Mark also allows us to experience some very practical side of teaching, Jesus' teaching and Jesus' life. We can see that practically because Jesus was also an amazing teacher and he's still teaching us today, amen? Anybody here experience Jesus' amazing teaching on a daily basis? Those Jesus teachable moments? Oh yeah, I do every day. When I leave church at around 5.15 from here and I drive eastward on Highway 68 towards Salinas, I'm praying, Lord, I want to love like you. I want to be patient like you. And then I get into traffic, <laughs> right? Amen? Anybody, anybody there with me? That's right, right? So Jesus, he's still teaching us today. He's still humbling us today and say, love like I love, right? And one of the neat things is that Mark's filled with hundreds of these teachings, hundreds of these examples to show Jesus how he teaches and how he loves people, but in particular, how he serves people. And so I wanna encourage you this week as you're doing the weekly reading to look for Jesus in Mark and look at how Jesus teaches and say, what do I learn from Jesus? And then what lesson is there for me today? And so it's a beautiful, beautiful example. And so I've only got time. I'm only going to share two of these Jesus teachable moments. And the first one actually is our first lesson is the little children in Jesus. And so we read in Mark 10, 13 through 16, we read that people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, he placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Now that word indignant, right? Let's just make sure we're clear on that. That says, that means feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. So what was it that Jesus was so angry, so, so he just was so deeply moved by? Well, 
It wasn't the fact that the people were bringing the children, was it? Because the Jewish people, actually, they believed that the children were a necessity, that they were important, right, to carry on the family lineage. And, and bringing them to a rabbi, a teacher like Jesus, would have been something that they would have expected. And Jesus clearly saw the children as essential, right? Not just for tomorrow, but in today, the kingdom of God, like for these, he says, today and tomorrow. But unfortunately, the disciples saw them quite differently, didn't they? See, the disciples saw them as like a nuisance or insignificant. And so the disciples did something that none of us should ever do. And so I want to illustrate that point a little bit for you. And so um, would you help me? Would you audience, would you represent, and even if in the family worship venue and online, would you represent the people who are bringing the children to Jesus? Amen? Will you do that for me and play that part? Okay. And then over here, we'll say that Jesus is back here. I don't think anybody here wants to volunteer to be Jesus today, do they? Uh, okay, no volunteers. All right. So Jesus is back here. You've got the children. You're the people bringing, right? I'll play the disciples. Let me show you what the disciples are doing. And over here, I can't believe, who do these parents think they are? I mean, after all, Jesus is way too important. These children, I can't believe that they would actually want to bring these children. How in the world? I mean, don't they realize how busy we are? We're on our way to Jerusalem. And I can't believe, who do these people think they are bringing these children to Jesus? I mean, after all, we are important. And so we are going to represent Jesus. And this is the point that they were, did. The disciples. So instead of enabling the families to bring their children, they had become barriers to Jesus, like a bouncer, right? They were blocking these families from bringing their children to Jesus. They'd missed the mark. And so Jesus, Jesus, he sees the children, right? They're not a burden. They're not to be discarded. But we're supposed to welcome those children, right? That's what Jesus' point was. And Jesus also said that children serve as a significant model for our faith. That children represent how we should humbly and completely surrender our lives to him. So we need to do our part then to bring Jesus to the children and bring children to Jesus. See, we can't be barriers. We should actually be bringers. To Jesus, right? We should be like, hey, I'm so glad you came. There, let, let me bring you to Jesus, right? Let me get you up here. Like, oh yeah, you brought your children? Oh, I'm so glad you came. Would you, would you come this way? He's right here. See, we need to be bringers, not barriers, right? So we think about that. As parents, we need to bring Jesus to our children. As grandparents, bring to our grandchildren. Obviously, that's where the first and foremost responsibility lands, Right? But did you notice something here? It says that the people were bringing children. It's not just the parents. You recognize it was a community effort, right? This was a team effort. They were all bringing. So we all, we all have to welcome children. We all have a part to play in bringing the children to Jesus and bringing Jesus to the children. And I saw a powerful example of this just a couple of weeks ago, actually it was last Saturday, I was over at Laurelwood Elementary School. There was a group of families who actually had their children out there and they were serving. We had multiple churches represented. We went to the school and we set up a day of sports and games and it was a chance for the churches to just love on the children, to live this out, to bring Jesus to the children. And it was this beautiful example. And when I saw, I looked over at one point and the principal of the school who's invested his entire life to education and children and families. And I looked over at his face at one point when these families, and these families from Shoreline and other churches were serving, and he just had this face. His face was just overjoyed, just seeing how people were loving on his kids. And then I had to stop and go, oh, how great what a joy our Savior must be experiencing. Jesus looking and seeing how these people, us, his people, his children, were loving on these children. What great joy that must have brought him, amen? People bringing Jesus to the children. 
And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Obviously, there's, there's needs in our local community. There's ways that you can go into schools and bring Jesus and be Jesus for children. You can do that all across the world. But can I just tell you about a unique opportunity that you would have right here at Shoreline Church? Every summer, our church has a blessing. We are a sending and equipping church. We have a large number of military families who come, and they call Shoreline their home church for a season. And many of them serve. In particular, they serve in places like children's ministry and student ministries. And so when they come, they're here for a season. But then at some point, the U.S. military says they're going to send them elsewhere. Not that we, we, we don't like that, but we know that God's calling them somewhere else. And so what happens is we have a gap because those, those families, they leave and we don't have the new families in yet. So over the summer, there's like this window of time where we need to close the gap to have enough volunteers in our children's ministry, our student ministries, so that we can bring more children, as many children as possible, so that they can become totally committed to Jesus Christ. So I just want to share that with you because there's an opportunity for you to serve a defined, narrow period and meet the need. And so I want to look at our next, our second and we see another example of Jesus' teaching specifically on how we should serve as the feuding disciples. And we read about this great story in, in the end of Mark 10. And, and what was going on was that Jesus and the disciples were on the way to Jerusalem where Jesus would go to the cross. And along the way, James and John pull Jesus aside and they're like, hey, Jesus, hey, who, would you let one of us, who, one of us will sit on your right and one of us will sit on your left when you're in your glory in heaven? You see, they were jockeying for the prime seats, right? Somehow they'd missed the mark. They'd missed the fact that Jesus came to serve and that he'd asked them to do the same. And so listen how Jesus responds. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. I'm paraphrasing Jesus here, but Jesus is basically saying, don't lead like others do. If you're my follower, you put others' interests before your own and serve them. Radical, transformational leadership philosophy. And so what we learn from Jesus is that greatness, it's not found in who serves us, but it's how we serve others. That's where greatness lies. That's what Jesus teaches us. So I want you to take a moment and just, just for a second, think. Think of your favorite leader in your life. Who's made the greatest impression on you? Maybe it was a parent, a grandparent, a teacher. Maybe it was a coach. And what was it about them, them investing in you? It was not that they were so great. It was how they served you, right? Right? It was how they modeled that for you. And so there's a great lesson for us. In a culture that embraces self-promotion and selfishness, we must lead with sacrificial love, humble service, and joyful submission to Jesus. The same way that Jesus taught and modeled for us is how we should lead and love others. See, Jesus has this radical leader development model and this is what it says. Do you want to be great? Do you want to be a great leader? Do you want to be a great spouse? Do you want to be a great parent? Do you want to be a great business leader? Whatever that might be. Jesus says one word, serve. Serve. And we live in a culture, right? And our flesh says, serve me. Serve me. It's all about serving me, right? And Jesus says right here, Jesus says, no. Serve me. And because you are my follower, that means that you will serve others. Our love for Jesus is why we would serve and how we should serve. And so whatever capacity that you're, you're leading today, your goal, my goal, it's not to point them to us. It's to point them to Jesus, right? In the way that we serve them. That's how they will be drawn to Jesus, how we serve them, not how they serve 
us, amen? And so I just wanna remind us as we close, Mark's gospel, it greatly encourages us and it exhorts us in our faith to stand strong and to know what we believe. And it also gives us this beautiful picture to call us to love and to serve like Jesus did. We should serve humbly, we should serve joyfully, and we should serve willingly. And so as I close, I'm gonna lead you with, just leave you with two questions for you to reflect on. And as Dennis said, we changed up the service. So as we're singing and celebrating and worshiping, I just wanna give you these two questions for you to reflect on. Number one, how am I serving? How am I serving in my marriage? How am I serving my family? How am I serving at work? How am I serving in my school? How am I serving in my church? Whether it's here at Shoreline or maybe you're visiting today in your home church. How am I serving? And knowing what you now know to be true, how will I serve like Jesus with greater intentionality? That's what I want you to really reflect on. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've given us this powerful, powerful example of love in that we are called not to serve ourselves, but to serve others. And Jesus, we thank you that we can turn to you when we feel like we don't have the strength to do that, but we know through the power of your, your Holy Spirit that we can do that. And so Jesus, we yield the rest of this time of worship to you. We yield our lives to you. Have your way, Jesus, we pray. Amen.